Now, let's, we picked, we left off at page 124 where we're starting a new topic in public land use control. And this section is going to talk about <coughs> uh, the Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. And this section is going to help us identify the purpose of that, uh, what building codes are, and some different environmental legislations and uh, um, the American with Disability Act. Now, the Interstate Land Sale Full Disclosure Act is a law that, now this says this is a law, so this is a national law, okay? The Interstate Land Sale Full Disclosure Act this law requires those in the interstate sale or lease of subdivision lots to file a statement of record and register the details of the land with HUD. And what that means is that this is that if land is being sold or leased between two different states, it becomes a federally regulated <coughs> transaction, okay? And it, all those details have to be registered with the HUD or the housing authority. Federal Housing Authority. Okay, they do have, they do exempt the sale of lots and subdivisions containing fewer than 25 lots, so you can highlight that. And the property report has to contain essential information. The property report they register with HUD has to contain certain information described in those bullet points. And then we move on down that page 124. Now, the North Carolina has a lot of local guidelines for building, whether it's commercial or residential. They have some guidelines that they've enacted that are called building codes. So when a developer wants to build either a strip mall or they want to build a, a commercial building or somebody wants to build a bunch of houses. So what, whether they want to build residential or commercial, they must obtain a building permit, which is a permit from the city saying, yes, you can build this. And then they have to abide by a series of statewide building codes. So one of the important things to know is that when new construction is being built, there are codes for each phase of construction, and at each phase of construction, the building must be inspected. So the foundation gets poured, the city comes to inspect. The property gets framed, the city has to complete an inspection. So whatever they have a building code for, they have to inspect at that phase of construction. Once the city has completed the structure inspection and the structure is ready to be lived in or sold or inhabited by a commercial use, they, the inspector will issue what is called a certificate of occupancy. You see that term in the middle of page 125. The certificate of occupancy is what says the city has inspected this property and this property is ready to go. It is ready to be either sold or leased, okay? You will hear the term CO a lot when you get into practice and if you sell new construction. CO is the hot term because once the CO is issued, the property is very close to ready to be conveyed. Uh, one of the important things to know about occupancy and permitted space is that, so I'm going to talk about the last sentence of that paragraph on the top of page 125. Unpermitted space may be included in heated living square footage, but if the property is not permitted, that must be disclosed as a material fact. This is referring a lot to finished basements. You will go into a lot of homes that are maybe homes a little bit older 
but they've got a finished basement. And the seller might say, oh, you know, I had my cousin Joe do all of this, but he's a general contractor, but we didn't pull any permits because we wanted to save money. Okay, and that's fine, but the fact that it's not permitted space has to be fully disclosed. One of the other important things you should know about square footage, because we're going to address it in our fall, in our chapter, I think it's chapter 8, <clears throat> is that as brokers, we need to know and make our seller clients aware that if they do have finished basement square footage, it is not going to necessarily be appraised at the same value as main level square footage. I have seen appraisals where they actually give the garage more dollar per square foot than they do the finished basement because an appraiser will actually break down each part of the house and how many dollars per square foot he is appraising it at. <clears throat> so, you know, you're going to sell a property that's got a thousand unfinished or a thousand finished square feet basement and the seller's likely going to want the same value on the main level as the basement. Or, or rather, he's going to want the same value per square foot on both levels. And as brokers, we should know that even if the space is permitted, it's not necessarily going to get that same value on an appraisal. But if the space is unpermitted, we definitely need to find that out and disclose that because that is a material fact. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the other um, material facts for a property is whether or not it's in a flood zone. There is a website. FEMA has its own website. You can actually go onto the FEMA website and type in an address and it will tell you if that property is in or bordering a flood zone. <clears throat> One of the uh, questions you will ask your seller clients when you go to list a house is, Mr. Seller, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, are you carrying flood insurance in this property? Because if they're carrying flood insurance, then it's very likely the buyer's going to also need to get flood insurance. Lender is going to require, so a buyer's lender would require flood insurance. <clears throat> but why this is so important to you is that if you have a buyer client who is, <clears throat> let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, they're approved for $200,000 purchase price. What we need to know is that the lender has taken that buyer's financial profile and qualified them for a monthly payment that they then equate to a purchase price. <clears throat> Anything that gets thrown into that monthly payment, whether it's flood insurance, homeowner association dues, those things actually affect the purchase price amount the buyer will be qualified for. Flood insurance is usually a pretty hefty expense, so it can actually significantly reduce the amount that the buyer is qualified to purchase. So $200,000 home could mean only $150,000 if that property is in a flood zone or if that property has a significant HOA fee. So that's why another reason that the what if a property is in a flood zone or if a property has HOA fees and restrictions that's another reason those are so important to disclose and to find out because you could be halfway through a transaction with your buyer only to find out they're not actually going to qualify because now they need flood insurance <clears throat> so land located in flood hazard areas is subject to having to get flood insurance and certain restrictions that a buyer should know about before they enter into a contract to purchase. Um, highway access, access to a public road, of course, is very important, but any planned, and I'm looking at the third line down, if there is any planned construction
construction of new highway, freeway, loop road. Real estate brokers are expected to be aware of this and make a full disclosure to any potential customer or client. Now in our next chapters, when we start talking about agency, we're gonna distinguish between the customer and the client. But notice here that it says you have to make this disclosure to a customer or a client. Because one of the things that we must always disclose to an individual, whether they are our customer or they're in our or they're our client with a signed agency agreement, we owe everybody disclosure of a material fact. And so planned highway construction is, is a material fact. And whether you have an agency agreement with someone or not, you owe them that disclosure. And we're going to talk a lot more about material facts and full disclosure when we get into our next, um, well, when, when you get into your next chapters, you're going to see that. Um, but highway access and highway plan and plans are a material fact and should be fully disclosed whenever possible. <clears throat> now, turn your books to page 126. One of the most important things to note off of these, these top two paragraphs is that the Americans with Disabilities Act only refers to commercial property. So when a developer is developing a property for a use that is going to be commercial, they must have in handicap access. A developer who's going to be building residential property does not, does not have to put a ramp on every house. Okay? So that's kind of, you may see a question that kind of asks you to distinguish. So a, a house, a residential property does not have to comply with ADA guidelines. Okay? The federal government, and it says it in the first sentence, has recently mandated that new commercial buildings and older public buildings must meet the standards of the ADA. I worked in, I used to work in a department store, and they used to always say, you know, the space in the aisles has to be at least three feet wide so a wheelchair can get through. And boy, they would cram those go those racks together so close, I'd be like, how is a wheelchair ever going to get through this? You know what I mean? But that was always a guideline that I remember before I got into real estate. Now I think, okay, so, you know, they want to make it friendly for people who are going to want to shop if they're handicapped or not. Now, we talked a little bit about privately imposed land use controls otherwise known as restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants can also be called a declaration of restrictive covenants. You might see them being called protective covenants. So those terms will be used interchangeably and they want to change it from restrictive to protective because they feel like those covenants protect the neighborhood and those covenants protect the value of that neighborhood by making homeowners abide by certain rules to help keep the neighborhood looking a certain way so that everybody's value is protected. <clears throat> One of the important things to note about that is that, so I've seen, and maybe I'm sure you have too, where you have a new construction community or a community that's subject to these protective covenants smack dab in the middle of an area of older homes that are not subject to restrict to the protective covenants. And what you want to know about that, so I'm in the middle VIP paragraph on page 127, <clears throat> is a couple things we talked about. Restrictive or protective covenants cannot be so strict that they prevent the free transfer of property, number one. And that's in the middle, that's the second sentence of that VIP paragraph in the middle of 127. And the last sentence of that 
that paragraph that says when zoning guidelines and protective covenants are in conflict, the more restrictive of the two takes precedence. So <clears throat> I used to work in a neighborhood when I sold new construction that was attractive land smack dab in the middle of a lot of older homes that were not subject to the covenants of that community. And you had those neighbors and they could do all sorts of things. You had neighbors back there with chicken coops. You had neighbors back there with different kinds of fences and things. But in our community, which was directly adjacent to those houses, we were subject to covenants that were stricter than those zoning guidelines. So even though their neighbor, 25 or 100 feet away, could have chickens, they could not even though the zoning even though they were really close together you're going to want to know make sure you know <clears throat> for purpose of the test and for practice the more restrictive of the two if there's ever a conflict the stricter one is going to win one of the so let's just say now i'm going down to the next paragraph let's just say you're you have a buyer who is in a neighborhood and their neighbor starts to violate the restrictive covenant somehow okay the they do have a right to pursue legal action or to report that neighbor to the hoa right and say hey my neighbor has got trash all over their yard or hey my neighbor has two horses in their backyard like you know so they do have the report to i mean the the right thank you they do have the right to um, to report that homeowner and to seek legal action to get them to stop but what they want us to know is that if that homeowner does not pursue legal action to ask their neighbor to stop putting trash all over the yard or to get those horses out of their backyard they can actually lose their right to pursue it legally through a process called latches, which is in bold on the bottom of 127, which is defined as the loss of the right through the failure to assert it. Okay, latches is the loss of the right. So when you see the term latches, you'll think of restrictive covenants and the loss of the right to report your neighbor if you wait forever to do it. <clears throat> now, the responsibilities of us as brokers, again, we are not experts on reading restrictive covenants. We definitely do not write covenants in any way. Um, but if you're ever asked, hey, do you think the covenants will allow me to do this? Or do you think the zoning board will allow me to do that? <clears throat> We're not expected to be experts, but we're expected to know where to find the answers. Much like you can find the city's master plan with where they might plan to put highways, where they might be planning to change zoning or things like that. We would want to know to tell our clients, hey, you want to call the zoning board to ask that question or if it's a question about interpreting restrictive covenants I always pair them with the closing attorney that I like to work with so you'll want to pick some of those too when you get out there and <clears throat> that way your buyers have your clients have an attorney they can call when they have those questions um, that's that's another one of the many benefits of having attorneys and lenders that you enjoy working with is you can call them when you have these questions because they're going to be the ones to advise you. <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm on page 128. Look, take a minute and read numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the middle of the page. I'm going to read it.
up what we've been talking about <clears throat> throughout the chapter by saying we should avoid making representations about what a property can be used for or what restrictive covenants might actually be saying that the owner can or can't do. We're not expected to memorize all the flood zones on the FEMA map in our area, but we're expected to know where to find that information online so we can guide our clients. And <clears throat> when it comes to zoning, in the next paragraph, it gives us some advice that we should not make assumptions about certain businesses or activities that will be allowed based on what other property owners have done. In the middle of that last par second to last paragraph, it actually says, making assumptions about allowed activities based on what other properties have done is recipe for a liability suit. So that's just why it's so important that we help our people find the answers, but we don't actually assume or, do, you know, or make representations about what they can and can't do because we could be held liable for that. Um, that is pretty much it for this chapter. I do encourage you for chapters 5 and 6, and you can do it here if you want to, um, but I do encourage you to kind of do the unit quizzes, because the unit quizzes, while they are... They help you kind of get a grip on if you understand the material in that chapter. Although I can tell you that the questions on your test are going to be a lot wordier and a lot more in-depth. 